you. Hello, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. So nice to see you all. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Kathy. Well, what an introduction, my word. Hello, it's incredible. Thank you, Kathy. We could have spent the whole hour listing your achievements, actually. <laughs> yes, Wendy. Now, the Lennon Hall, it's nice to be here because I know it's somewhat of a hub for, for local writers. Do you spend much time here? I do. So I, get, I have a Wednesday off work now, which is absolutely wonderful for me. So I sometimes come to either the Lennon Hall, or if I don't come to the Lennon Hall, I go to Central. Probably I work, as you say this, Patsy, but I probably work harder at Central because <laughs> when I work in the Lennon Hall, I go to Tim Hortons for coffee, <laughs> I go to Costa, I go to Cafe Nero. Um, I'm always out there. Oh, need to new boots. I need to go to Space NK. So if I if I go to the central, I probably are going to work. I've got to work harder. Yeah. Work. yeah. Um, but I love I love the linen hall. I love it. Yeah. This work is brilliant. It's fantastic. So we've heard about your. Uh, Patsy mentioned your two uh, short story collections. I'm sure you're familiar with them. And a novel coming. So we'll get to that at the end. That's okay. very exciting. But let me take you back to starting to write in earnest. Because it was really only in about 2016, which I, I'm staggered by. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what happened with me was that I ended up, some people have heard this before, but I ended up having one afternoon off work a week, and um, it was a Monday afternoon, and I thought to myself, right, I want to do something with this instead of just mooch around the town, going for coffee, sitting and reading a magazine. Although I love that gorgeous way to spend your time. But I thought, let's try and do something with this. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I sort of thought, I wonder if I could, you know, go to the gym that time every week. I really fit. Or maybe I should just spend the time trying to read a newspaper properly or do something or other. And I saw on Facebook, actually, that Sting and Fly in Dublin, their publisher, um, they also have a magazine, they were running this six-month course, um, just sort of a workshop, basically. And I thought, I wonder if I could, I wonder if I could get on that. And you had to write a 2,000 word story to be selected for it. I just remember at the time, 2,000 words just seemed like this absolute daunting task, you know? Um, and so I, I wrote this 2,000 word story and then ended up getting on this course, which was great, very, very good. Um, and as a result of that, I had a story called um, To All the Jews that ended up being put in the Stinging Fly magazine. And so as you say, this thing kind of magazine, it sounds like take a break or something like that. It's kind of, a, you know, it's almost like a book, this magazine. Um, and the guy who's in charge of Sing and Fly, a guy called Declan Mead, he contacted me and said, look, I'm interested in you maybe doing a collection. And it was very tentative at that stage. It wasn't like a done day that this was going to happen. But he said, I'm interested. Now, I know it, it, it depends on what you know about this kind of literary world, and I'm not said that this is the absolute be all and end all things because it's like a quite esoteric thing in some ways but Devlin made in this world is massive right he's like the sort of Simon Kyle of the <laughs> Irish short story <laughs> dimension and so getting a phone call from Devlin saying um, I'm considering doing a collection with you he was, Kevin Barry's been there before you know there's all these different amazing Colin Barra all these different writers so I can remember very clearly, it was, actually a, it was actually an email, and I can remember for some reason, I was only wearing a pajama top, I don't know why, and I immediately just got a drink, a tequila and orange, and just thought, <laughs> wow, this is absolutely incredible. So it was utter euphoria. Um, and then suddenly I thought, right, so I now have to uh, come up with goods. And I met up with him, and he said, um, you know, what do you think you can do? And I want you know when you meet people you want to try if you're dynamic and terribly capable. And I says, Well, I can write a short story every six weeks. And he went, right, okay, that's what I hold you to. So he did actually that year. I, I knew this was last chance saloon for me. Uh, I kind of knew that this was my one shot at it, really. And that I would just write a, a short story every six weeks. And I did that for a year, I probably did that for actually a year and a half. So I probably would have had about 18 or so of these stories. Um and Got them. Well, maybe not quite as many. Maybe about fifteen. I would have had. Sometimes I wrote one in a month. And then how many of those ended up then? An extra, an extra eleven or eleven or twelve of them. And how closely were they related to what you first came up with? Well, one of them's in it. The first one's in it. Yeah. So the first, the first story was a story called Locksmiths, 
and um, it's it's the one that I sent to try to get on this thing in five course. It did it did improve over. The, I mean, I I do edit my work a lot, and this thing did improve over the over the course of the of the workshop. But it's essentially the same. It's essentially the same story, you know. I mean, I think, and before, I mean, that's and that's it. That's amazing how that all happened um, for you then in twenty sixteen. But what was in your life before then? Like, what are the key facts about your life before that time? that has resulted in you becoming a writer. <clears throat> it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Well, I suppose, you know, if I'm looking back, Cathy, look, if I'm looking back to primary school, probably the my most pleasurable experience in primary school was like we had a teacher called Mrs. Ledley and on a Thursday afternoon she put up a picture on the board like of a giant American redwood or some sort of picture and you were given about an hour and a half just to write whatever you wanted for that time. Now, I absolutely loved that. I thought it was fantastic, but other parents didn't like that for their kids and complained, and then it was stopped um, <laughs> because, you know, it wasn't, it it wasn't, wasn't a math. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't very structured, or, you know, some people maybe just didn't like it. And also, what she did was, <laughs> you probably wouldn't do this now, but she, she gave you a Mars bar. If, you, if she liked what you'd done the previous week, you get a Mars bar. So to me, that was utter bliss. You just, you just sat for an hour and a half, munching away in a Mars bar, looking at a picture and writing something about it. It was just absolutely fantastic. Um, so there, so I'd always, I, I always did enjoy writing and I always did enjoy making up things. Uh, terrible liar. Always make, always lying as well as a teenager um, and a kid. But also, I just, I just kind of, like writing but not for other people just for my just for myself so we did a blog for a little while and i was also you know still am an english teacher so you know i don't like it you know partner kids that was all there as well but I suppose when it comes to writing i mean what you bring to bear on it is just everything you've ever experienced you know you could, it's easy enough to say oh i'm influenced by like if you said to me who you're influenced by in your writing i could pick three or four writers and you know, very obviously point out things that I do similar to them, or, you know, like I was looking at the writer Gordon Byrne just this morning, and, you know, there's a character talks about writing about life with crust song, which I think is a really good phrase to describe what I'm also hoping to do. So there's, there's things, the overt things, explicit things you're quite aware of, but then there's all the other things that you bring into bear in your writing that you don't really have much of a notion of. You know, all the conversations you've ever had, all the relationships you've ever been in, you know, all the music you've heard, the films you've seen, the TV programmes you've watched. It's all it's all there and a lot of that comes out without you being conscious of it. Yes, it's interesting. In the beginning of uh, Dance Move, the quote that you have is from William Blake, yeah. Joy and Woe are woven fine, yeah. clothing for the soul divine. Yeah. And it also made me think of Chekhov and his laughter through tears kind mm -hmm. of thing. And that's very much... Uh, reviewers often pick that up about your work, mm -hmm. that the, the, the dark and the light yeah. sort of coexist. Well, the only problem with that, Cathy, is if you don't find this funny, right? <laughs> um, that, that then rather scuppers my modus operandi. If, if you don't find these books very funny, then they're gonna, it's going to be a bit of a grim experience um, for you. Because, I mean, if I just do a quick, you know, if I just do a quick... Uh, Look down it. Uh, you know, mathematics, murder, Mrs. Dallas-Sander, well, I'll skip that one and back to it. Um, you know, you've got his mother, suicide, dance move, sexual abuse, Gloria Max, a guy's kill, buildings, Roman, addiction, sale, Maoist cult, um, coercion, imprisonment, nearly kill a guy, nostalgia, loyalist, death squad, murder many people, um, Meadow Mori, uh, domestic, well, the guy kills his, his girlfriend and another person kills another person. So, you know, there's, there's, I'm not trying, it's that life of like the life of the crusts, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm not trying to shy away from, from negative things. And so what you do need with that, I think, for it to be an interesting read for me, is you, you do need some sort of counterbalance of, of, of funniness and humour. But if, you know, so much humour, there was going to be something fairly, it's going to be a subjective thing, it's a very personal thing as to what people find funny. So if you don't find if you don't find it funny at all, if you don't see any humour in it, it might be a little bit of an old or black or dark reading experience. Mm -hmm. I think people do generally. Good, good, yeah, good, I think good. I do. Um, I'd love to hear um, a little 
a piece of a story. You, you've picked a couple of readings okay. you like. Should we start with, with Lily and Dog? Okay, yeah. From this, Sweet Home. Yeah, this is from, this is from Lily, yes. This is from Sweet Home. I haven't read this one in a bit, so we'll see. See how it goes. Uh, Lady and Dog. I don't want to. I don't want to want too much about it. But Lady and Dog is about a woman who basically falls in love with the wrong person twice. So she ends up falling in love with. Um, whenever she's a teenager, she falls in love with uh, a married a married man, which does not end up going well. And then she also um, later on falls in love with a uh, Gaelic player who comes to work in the school and just comes in to help kids with PA in the school where she where she works. Um, so I'll just read some little some little sections from this. She's called Alda McClure. Mrs. Drogan has brought in initiatives which Olga has not embraced. Children assessing their own work. Children celebrating Chinese New Year. Graduation ceremonies for pupils moving on to new key stages. Gaelic football training. Olga has never concealed her disapproval of these projects. She nibbled only the edge of a spring roll at Chinese New Year. When it came to Gaelic football, she asked Mrs. Drogan if the parents had been informed about it because there would be plenty who would take a dim view. Mrs. Drogan said that yes, of course, they'd been informed and not one had raised an objection. But that was probably because the letters from the school had turned to pulp at the bottom of the children's bags, soggy with leaked juice and squashed fruit. Olga had taken it upon herself to bring that Gaelic issue to the attention of George Shields, a massive muscle tattoo taught by her when he was nine and skinny. A fortuitous meeting outside the chemist's one day allowed her to ask if Mason, his son, was looking forward to the Gaelic football. George was pretty sanguine. Where was it happening? Only the school assembly hall? There weren't going to be playing matches anywhere? He shrugged. Well, whatever, he had said. At the front of Martinez fight, he did a photo taken with Carl's wife. She was lovely, and she was from the west of the city. It was only the school assembly hall, a bit of exercise. People needed to chill for Christ's sake because it was 2018. It's developed into a reasonable evening. On a night like this, girls will be out in the room, those same girls who, five, six years ago, sat at a desk in her room, calculating angles, and who are now leaning against the windows of the takeaway or the off license. Mostly they don't acknowledge her. She's well used to the imperious blanking, finding it almost amusing in its way. The strained denim of her hot pants, worn even at this time of the year, the legs burnished with fake tan. They look down at their breasts as if to check they're still there. And then the love bites, those badges proclaiming carnal success. She sees them, those badges worn with pride. Don't they all just consider themselves the first to discover it? The pioneers? You think I don't know, Olga wants to say. You think I don't know about the love bites, not on my neck. And the purple and green thumbprints on that fine skin on her hips. Well, a strong, sunburnt, sapling body poured into a tight dress. Well, strong becomes stocky as time goes by, and a tight dress is passed over in favour of a comfort cut. How could they ever think she knew? The first time that the Gaelic fellow Cormac appeared, Olga deliberately overran her lesson. It was only when Mrs. Drogan appeared that they had to terminate what they were doing. Cormac the Gaelic fellow had shaken her hand hard when Mrs. Drogan introduced them. His arms were covered with freckles. He said, I was wondering when you lads were. I was wondering if you were ever going to turn up. Well, they're here now, Mrs. Drogan said. Hey, why are you not put your trainers on? You're not going to go yourself. The question was directed at Olga. I don't think so, she said, unsmiling. Well, you better have them next week, he said. Try and find your old school PE kit as well, see if you can still fit into it. Probably still knocking about the house somewhere. Olga had considered going to see Miss Drogan because that was absolute 
insolence. And she did not appreciate it. Only in the place five minutes and the Gaelic fellow was already taken liberties. Futile though. Miss Drugan would say it was nothing more than a joke. Olga noted when the pupils enjoyed their session with him and did what he said without complaint. Balls went bouncing down the hall. Balls went bouncing up the hall. The estate crowd, who she thought, hoped, might be trouble, listened to every word he said. Well, the very little allegiance they had to her was reassigned to the Gaelic fellow within five minutes of flying footballs and bean bags. The next time that Corbett the Gaelic fellow came, Olga ensured that she was there promptly in the assembly hall with the children. All right, Chief, he'd said to her, you're going to be giving it a go today? We're going to be seeing a bit of involvement from you today? Olga said that there were things she needed to do back in the room. No point in getting too involved in case she had to leave. He just nodded. Sure, he said, no props. Next time, though, from the window, she watched him leave after the session. He wore a top with the name of something on it. Those curving, tubby letters, that way of writing. She had never really liked it. Someone had bought her a mug once that had coffee written on it like that, and she put it in the back of the cupboard. Celtic collection. Celtic collection. That was the shop of the time with its sign written like that. She really wouldn't wear anything green. Her least favourite sweet out of the pastels was the green. <laughs> Just the way it was. Mrs. Rubin had seen her in the corridor that afternoon and had asked if everything was going well with Corby. Olga said that, well, there hadn't been any complaints. There hadn't been any complaints so far. Just the way it was. That way of writing, though, she's become accustomed to it. That mug, it might still be there, right at the back. Red, Wendy, fantastic. I, I love this character of Olga. It's interesting it's set in a school. I can mm -hmm. imagine you, there's a lot there um, that you were familiar with, the surroundings and the kind of people. But where does a character like Olga come from, whose sort of inability to deal with her own emotional state, you know, results in this just disapproval and dislike of everything and mostly everyone? Uh, where does she come from? I think everybody's like that to a certain degree. Uh, well, I suppose what I'm interested in is the, is the inner life that um, people people can't articulate. Either they can't articulate it, they don't have the tools to, to articulate it, or else they don't want to articulate it, or else it's dangerous to articulate it. So I think I suppose that everybody is 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 a bit like that to some to some degree. Um, and I suppose what I'm interested in as well is just with her the idea of illicit relationships. I mean, this is a person that twice has been in a relationship that she cannot tell anybody about. So it's that whole idea of, of, of something very significant to someone that cannot be spoken. And so, um, you know, the first time around, she's, she's in a relationship as a teenager with a man who is married, and this man is killed. But she cannot speak to anybody about that because she was the she was the girlfriend that no one was meant to know about. So her grief can't ever be articulated. And then what happens second time around? She's a woman in her sixties maybe, and she falls for this this lovely lad that comes in, but he's only a young man in his twenties. So she couldn't articulate that great love, which it is really to anybody, because it would just seem so unbelievably ridiculous. And so what I was thinking about this book, uh, Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, and there's a really moving part uh, to me at the end of the Age of Innocence where, um, I don't know if people know this book, but this, this man is, um, Leland Archer, is basically in, in love with somebody other than his wife. And that's the way it is the whole way through um, the whole way through his marriage. And this is something that he can't ever articulate or express. Um, and he realizes at the very, very end, in the very final chapter, through something that his son says, he realizes that the person who did know was his wife. His wife knew that, and his wife had said, I he gave up the most the thing that was most important to him. So the person who did, so he realizes in retrospect that somebody did know his suffering 
and it was his wife. But I thought, I'm going to deprive Olga of even that. Um, <laughs> Olga, Olga's not going to help anybody, you know? That's what's so sad about it. That's her desperate loneliness that she has. And also the, when, when in the first, the first lover, the old married lover, and she's desperate for something from him. And she says, what is it you love about me? What is it you like about me? And he's like, you're 17. Yeah. That's all people say to her. Yeah. 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 And you can see then that she then takes all of that feeling and, you know, that results in then dislike for the 17 year old, 16 year olds that she, that she sees. It's that thing where you, what we dislike in others is really what we dislike in ourselves. If you've heard that, you know, when we find other people annoying for some reason, it's probably because they like us. It's, yeah. it's almost like that as well. Yeah. Um, does character always come first? Obviously, the characters are super strong. Is character what it's about for you, Wendy? Yes. Rather than what happens to mm. them or what happens around them? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, see, with these conversations, you can sometimes, uh, I can be really kind of splashy and go, yes, I always do it this way. And I know I'm kind of retrofit in that because I know that some ways, sometimes I do it a totally different way. But 99% of the time, it's it's character for me. So I kind of think if I... If I have a, a sense of the ending in sight, if I think, well, I want this person to go to this place at this time at the end and this to happen to them, then I'm maneuvering that person the whole way to try to fit a plot. Um, and so I don't really like to do it that way. I like it to be more organic, that I get to know the character and the character drives things. So rather than the character being the vehicle or cipher for something or whatever, that it's, it's the character that that determines, I suppose, what's going to what's going to happen in terms of a, in terms of action. So, would you come up with a character in a story, say, like Cell, for instance, mm -hmm. where it's a it's a young, well, a woman who's sort of being virtually imprisoned in a kind of almost a cult kind of scenario? Not quite as it's more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. But how, if you've come up with the idea of this woman, if it's not something of your experience, when I mean, you're saying, obviously, we've all had you know, bad relationships and we've all with parents and things that we can sort of delve into that. But when it's something like that that's totally other, how do you go about getting into the mindset of, of someone like that? So the, the, the way I would work it would be that normally there's, normally there's something or other. So there might be something that triggers a character. If we sort of go back to even beyond the character, there'll be something or other that will that will trigger an idea of a of a character. And it, it could be it could be something or it could be a fragment of a lyric or it could be maybe just something I see in the street, something just the way they bend over or some something or other like that. Something pretty innocuous, maybe something quite random. And then what I do is I write so these stories are mostly about six thousand words, sometimes a wee bit more something but less but what i try to do is i try to write a first draft it's probably about twenty thousand words so probably about three four times more than what i than what i need and the reason i'm doing that is because i'm just getting to know the person and getting to know this character as as i'm as i'm writing and sometimes they'll say um no, no way I, I'm not. So I really missed it, Ned. Doris Stokes this year <laughs> that these people are talking to me and saying no way, I'm not doing that, or whatever. But that is how it. That is how it is, really. Or I will look at what's been said at the beginning and think, no way would that person say that because I know them better now, and I know that they wouldn't say that thing that was the you know they're saying at the beginning of the story or whatever. So I suppose for me, it's just it's getting to it's just it's just writing and writing, imagining them in different situations, putting them with different people, um, and just 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 basically being with them for a duration of time. So it's that, that idea of killing your darlings then, so you have to go back through all of that and sort of it's what you leave out is almost as important as, as what you put in. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it works a couple of ways. I mean, with, with that, um, what I'm trying to leave out are the bits that are all to do with me. So see bits where I think, oh, that's really clever, that's a great turn of phrase, or that's a great joke or whatever. Those things need to be removed because they're nearly always serving me and not the story. So you're thinking, right, is that, what's that that service of, that funny little remark? Is that anything to do with the character or is this me trying to look big or clever or whatever? So you normally try to remove all of, all of that kind of thing. And then what I'm also trying to do as well is say, right, what can I trust the reader with? Because I think the way short stories work is that 
it's, it's, a, it's a particular type of relationship that you have with a reader a short story where you're expecting them to do a reasonable amount of work as well. But there's a lot of things that are maybe being suggested or things that they're going to have to project and, and so on. So a lot of the times what you try, I suppose the fancy word is like lacuna, you're trying to put gaps and spaces so that you can, you can allow people to... Um, you can allow people to put their own ideas in, so I'm trying to leave out as much as I can, um, in terms of um, in terms of just giving people too much information, and also as well when I do that really really long first draft, what I need to do is just sit and read it and think, what am I interested in here? Because sometimes what I think is going to be really central is actually really peripheral, and something that maybe somebody that only comes through a little bit ends up, I think, on the rewrite, they need to be center stage. So when you start that initial first draft, you don't really know about where it's going to end. No, not at all. Not at all. No. It's amazing. Well, it's just it's, it's exciting yeah. because you just you just do not you just do not know where it's where it's going to go. Mm. And what about then the editing process beyond that when you when the book's being edited? For publication, mm -hmm. is there a process there, or are you mostly done? Well, point? right, actually, so these stories have probably been rewritten about 20, 25 times or so. Um, it's just been it's just been done over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't show my work all around people. Um, so I know some people love that. Some people like that, that they're emailing it off to who crowd friends or whatever. I just I just don't do that because I think one one of the main things is that I have to work out myself if if things are operational. I, I have to work out is do I think this is any good? And I don't want that to be by sort of majority consensus, you know, I think that needs to be my my decision. Um, so I just work on it myself. And then with these books, they were they were edited by the, the guy Declan Mead in Dublin. So the stories were just sent to him. Um, but he's a man of very few words. You wouldn't mind me saying this, you know, and so I would just get back from Declan one one or two words like fine or um, so I was always delighted if we got fine. That's good. I That's thought amazing. this is great. But one of Declan's would be keep them coming. Right, mm -hmm. and keep them coming was a bit more sort of. Mm, don't know if that one is any good. That's why we need to keep them coming. So, so I just had to, yeah, we just got a little bit back, and then after that, there would be a, a, a tighter kind of edit, so like a line edit or, or whatever. So yeah, they would go through a lot of yeah. When Dance Move then came out, we put those stories together. Obviously, the door was a bit more open for you, mm -hmm. but was there? A bit more pressure was it like a difficult second album did you think you know am i going to be able to do it again yeah i did think that yeah i kind of i kind of wonder i mean i didn't have any particular trajectory or think oh you know i i'm trying to have a you know a, a literary career as such or anything like that so whenever he said would you like to do another book of short stories i thought yes that's absolutely great um and i i I, the very first story I wrote was the first one that's in that book, Mathematics. Um, and I remember feeling really emotional after I'd written it because I kind of did like that one. And I sort of thought to myself, still got it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Whether you like it or not, what I do, you know, that is very. That, that is quite typical of what I do, and it's also as well more or less of the quality of the other book. So I kind of thought, yeah, yeah, we're okay here, we're all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, good for you. I mean, you know, we spend so much time apologizing for ourselves. It's great that you say, still got it, it's there, I can do this. Yeah, yeah. And the short story form, you touched on it a little bit, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that there's a, a large appetite for it here, it would seem. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it a, a genre you think that gets enough respect, that gets enough love? Well, in some in some quarters, yeah, some quarters. You know, you can go to Cork. Cork Short Story Festival is just like absolutely incredible. All these short story aficionados and people from all over the world. It's utterly fantastic. So you're gonna have some pockets of people, places that will absolutely adore the the short story. Um, but yeah, I mean. I like novels as well, and I can see why people don't like short stories. Sometimes people like immersion, you know, the, the, the whole idea of they like to be immersed in a world for, you know, a sustained period of time. And I think even with, with books like mine, where it's quite geographically circumscribed, um, you, you're still having to recalibrate to a new world each time you start a new story. So sometimes people find it a bit sort of, oh, let's to start again. I find it more exhausting to read a short story collection than I do a novel because it's almost like drinking a load of shots rather than <laughs> sipping a big 
kind of something. Do you know, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. intense and you know, I couldn't just read one short story after the other. I just can't do that. But there's normally as well as that thing that as a there's a whole idea of future time. There's something quite creative a lot of the times about what, what the short story writer is doing in terms of endings mm -hmm. that you are expected to kind of project a sort of a future for these people. So you're co-opted into the meaning um, and into creating the meaning. And so, you know, that can also be a sort of a, a tarant thing. And my mom's sitting there, and whenever I first started writing short stories, she said, oh, she didn't do those. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really like them. And uh, she said, they made you feel so stupid. Right, short stories made her feel stupid. Right, but I get it. I get that. Um, and it's if you're expecting an ending to be very much um, resolved, um, you, the short story is not always offering that to you. Um, and it's, it's always a question if you're writing short stories, what way you want your ending to operate. Because if you shut it down totally at the end, I don't find that very satisfying reading experience. But if you leave it totally open people are like well what what have, what have i just read what was what was what was the point the point of that it's interesting because there's one of the stories and I, i'm sorry i can't remember what's on my head which one but there is at least one where you do choose to sort of tell us what happened what happens in the future so we've sort of finished with what's going on and then you say and then in a few years this happened and they split up and mm -hmm. they had a baby and, you know yeah is that just how that's just a decision for that story you just felt that's the right thing to do to, to project us into the future a little bit yeah, sometimes I'll do that. So that the Alison Rosedale thing. But so, sometimes I'll 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 do that. We'll project into the future a bit. Um, yeah, and I think I do that. The loose Roman, I do that as well. That, it, that it's it's another one that works like that. Yeah. Some sometimes I'll do that. I'll do that a little bit. Yeah. And do people then? What sort of feedback do you have? I imagine people write to you, do they, and tell you what they what they think the stories are about or how it's affected them. Yeah, it's really lovely. It's that idea that as soon as you as soon as you finished it and it goes out into the world, it's no it's no longer it's no longer yours. And so people's different interpretations have been have been just have been just incredible. So probably my favourite response is there's a story called The Soul Is No Skin at the end of the first book. It's about a guy called Barry. And um for some reason people seem to really take to this character, Barry quite a lot. He's a, he's a really decent person that ends up being caught up in, in a situation where all he's basically done is show kindness, but it, it ends up being a very, very, it, having a very negative impact on him. So I was in a bookshop in Edinburgh and this woman said to me, she was, she was the person who ran the bookshop, so she was a sophisticated reader, you know. She said, um, I just want to ask you, is Barry okay? Right? <laughs> I was so utterly touched by that because that was somebody that had she knew he was she knew he, he was a construct, but she she was there asking me, you know, what what did I think in terms of the life projected for this fake person beyond that full stop? What 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 did I think? Is he gonna be alright? So that was great. There's a there's a character called King Castles in um observation and a guy called so Kim Castles is a kind of a you know, I don't know how to describe her really, sort of attractive woman. Um, and this this man contacted and said, did I write custom stories? <laughs> oh, um, dear. Um, I said, uh, well, not yet. I'm going to offer it. Yeah, let's see how it goes. Declan will offer me a second book. Um, but he said, hey, um, would you write custom stories? And he wanted a custom story um, involving Kim Castles. Um, and, and in a garage, right? Um, so, very niche. yeah, very niche, very niche. So, with, so with that, and, but then there's another thing as well. Like we were talking at the beginning, and um, Kathy, about how there's things that, that are brought to bear, or that you know, you bring to bear in your writing that you don't even realize. Um, and so, there was somebody contacted me just to ask about my religious, my religious background. Um, because they, they find, yeah, so quite a lot of people have said this, that they find a lot of Bible references and they find a lot of um, just religious or biblical allusions in the writing. And I was totally surprised by that. And Kathy just said, telling me earlier, yeah. there's loads of references to, loads um, of plants. Plants. No, loads I, of plants. And I, I don't write about plants. And I, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, ne I, you know, my, what the garden in 
my house. The extent of my um, involvement with the garden, garden is looking out the window. At it, right? <laughs> so it's incredible that I'm referencing plants. It really is. But like somebody had said, Kathy, about um, Gloria and Max, and they had said about all of the, the biblical references towards the end of that story. Um, and they, they had talked about that and about how they had, they had found that really striking. And I was like, I don't, I don't think so, you can, right? But then when they told me through it, I could see exactly what they, what they meant. I, oh, as a person, like many people, you know, here, I would have gone to Sunday school, you know, for years and years and years. Um, and I, I never think of myself as religious in, in the slightest, but yet, obviously, all that is there. And I'm there. Is that, you know? Would you like to read a bit of Gloria and Max? Yeah, I'll read a bit of Gloria and Max, but I won't read the, I won't read the Bible bit, Not because Bible it's bit. actually quite sad. Um, so I'll, I'll read a bit more of a, well, I wouldn't say it's hilarious, but I'll, I'll read a bit that's uh, a bit more um, lighthearted. Okay. Yeah, so this the Dorian Max is basically about two people that are on their way to Christian Film Festival. Um, and you were saying about you know how to how to get these ideas. It's not that often they're coming from my own experience, but one time I did get a lift to a Christian Film Festival <laughs> um, with a guy who was working at Queens. Um, and he came from Florida, I think, and he was an expert in the films of Pasolini. Um, and he he was just as if he'd been beamed in from another from another planet. And um, so that that was that was the sort of that was the sort of idea here. So he is giving. I, I'm not Max. He's not. He's not. He's not Max. I'm not Gloria. But I'll just read a little bit of a uh, little bit of this. Um, so they're going along together. Uh, Max wondered how this woman might feel about being in a car in enclosed space with a man she didn't know. It might make her feel less uneasy if he banged on a bit about Yannicka. That would establish that he wasn't a threat and that Yannicka was a person who, if not there in physical manifestation, was constantly there in thought. Max rolled down the window. Gloria, he said, not loud enough. Gloria, he shouted. It sounded ridiculous, like some kind of dreadful Van Morrison tribute act. <laughs> Gloria! The woman looked over, unconcerned, and then walked towards the car. Hi, he said, once she got into the silence. I'm Max, and even though I have no idea how to get to this place, I've got the sat nav to help us. It's a straight road, Gloria said. <laughs> To get there. That's good to know, Max said, but he kept the sat nav on. So, Max said, here we are on our way to this planning meeting. You're very interested in film. Gloria considered this and then said, well, I'll watch a few things on the telly. Now I'm there. Film's actually what I'm involved in. You, Nick, Films. <laughs> no, no, I teach film at the university. Oh, she said. I'm a film academic. Okay, film academic. Teaching the people about films. Yes. How to make films. No, <laughs> no, how to watch them. Lesson one. How to turn on the TV, she said, looking out the window of the car. <laughs> I just moved to Belfast, Max began, but actually my partner's still in London. She's from Finland originally, but she's in London. Okay, Gloria said. Yes, said Max, she's called Yannicka. The distance makes no difference, really. Not that we're really so very far apart from each other, not really. Belfast and London, but you know, we're, uh, we're very in love. Gloria rearranged the hood of her anorak, where to get caught in the seat belt. Okay, said Gloria. Yeah, said Max. So what's your involvement then with this festival? Mr. Anderson said for me to go, she replied. Mr. Anderson's the boss of my place, he's the boss of all homes. They're going to be bringing all the old people, 
from the homes to see the films. That's going to be some job, she added. And what type of films do you expect that the old people will like? Old ones, <laughs> Gloria said. She looked round the car. Are you picking anybody else up? No, just you, Gloria. The car splashed by another lane. There was a buzz in the car from a fly. It crawled along the dashboard and then flew off to land again on the dashboard. Where is the home where you work then? Max asked. On the way out of Carrick, she said. Max smiled. <laughs> well, that's dependent really on which way you came into Carrick, isn't it? <laughs> Gloria paused. If you don't know whether you're coming in or out of Carrick, there's another hope for you. <laughs> Read up there. <laughs> A great ear for dialogue, but but it but it is. Are you constantly sort of airy wigging when you're out and about? Yes. <laughs> right. I I, mean, I just I just think the dialogue in so many books is terrible. It, it's it, if you listen to people, people are the stuff people say is so funny. Um, you know, it's 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 just so terrific and lively. I like, had a bus not so long ago from um, Belfast, Dublin. And the guys were guys were going to see Ice Cube, right? And at first I thought, oh, what a nightmare! I'm just gonna have to listen to these guys the whole time. And they were incredible. It was like they were talking about batter on on fish. Right? <laughs> they talked about batter at length. Then they talked about um, the Catholic education system. They then moved on to talk about um, some bar, some wee guy, wee Carlo, and some bar. And it was just it just went from one thing to the next. <coughs> it was absolutely so full of like energy and and delight. It was it was it was great. But you know. The, the way I write dialogue, I can imagine some people looking at my dialogue and just thinking, oh, well, you know, so what? It just seems really um, basic, you know? Um, you know, it's not like epic dramatic wit that you have these people speaking in like semicolons or whatever, but there's a lot of work that's gone into that dialogue to make it seem realistic. And, and to hope, you hope as well that for every couple of words it's said, there's this whole other depth of kind of suggestion and meaning because yeah, as you know, time. people people never mean they don't people never mean what they say. I don't seem totally paranoid, but you know, a lot of the time there's a subtext to what to what people are saying. Very know. much so. The, well, the thing I know people have heard this before. God said again, my favorite thing ever um, in terms of dialogue was um, we were in Castle Court and this woman in front of me had a little child. And the little child was wearing this cardigan, which is a type of cardigan you just never see nowadays, a beautiful, beautiful hand knit cardigan. And I said, Oh, it's a gorgeous wee cardigan. Where would you get something like that? And the woman said, Oh, we're other granny knit or that. Right? <laughs> I was just like, Wow, right? <laughs> There's a totally innocuous conversation about cardigan, pitch cardigan, and we did that family dynamic there. Yeah, you know, I like got a story in six words. Uh, uh, that's it. So you kind of, you, you, you can't have dialogue that's constantly about the story because then it becomes so freighted with meaning and significance, people will just get exhausted. <sighs> Everything here is fraught with symbolism, and you know it, it, it can't be constantly like that. But you do need a bit of that, you know, it's balance. And also, it's very much part of the text. Your dialogue, you don't really mm. use speech marks or she said, she uttered, none of that. No, no, so that's obviously deliberate. Mm. Well, it wasn't initially. So, I mean, this wasn't a stylistic choice initially. It was just something that I, I just started writing, and that's the way it was. So I, I, it wasn't ever a, a deliberate choice, and some sometimes for particular stories I have changed it, but most of the time I just like the flow, the flow of it, and I like the rhythm of the of the he says, he says, she says. I, I kind of I kind of like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean I'm not so wedded to it that if I was writing something and that just didn't seem to work, that I would kind of want to to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you know it yeah. would change if it didn't work. Let's, time is running out. Let me quickly ask you about the novel. All right. The novel. First of all, was it inevitable that you were going to write a novel? Was that always the end game? No, it wasn't. I mean, short story. Short stories were never even what I thought that I was. You know, I, I had, the short story was never that appealing to me initially because people talk about it so much in terms of all these rules and regulations and 
you know, you've got to try and do this by this point, and it's all very theoretical. And then I realised that was a little nonsense. You get very flexible and do what you want, really. Um, so there was that, but it was never inevitable. I was going to write a novel, and I don't even think it was inevitable that I would write another book ever again after after Sweet Home. You know, I think it's delusions of grandeur if you think it's going to be all these people knocking on your door, and you know, after the first book, if you don't. If you don't produce another one, so I don't think it was an, I don't think it was inevitable, but I've really loved doing it. Really what loved it. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's about um, so it's not right. It's not out there in the world, and it's, it's it'll go out in submission before before too long. Um, but what it's about, I think, is it's about um parents and what does it mean to be a, a good parent? Um, and it's about um three teenage boys who um. They're involved in the sexual assault of one of their friends, and it's from the point of view of the mothers of these boys, because they're wanting their sons out of this situation as quickly as possible. And it's about the stepdad of the girl, and it's about the it's about the, the girl as well. But it's like it sort of alternates um, between all these different people. But there's another fifty voices that all come in. So there's all these fifty, fifty or sixty maybe other first person accounts. But and some of these people aren't even connected to it. So there's all sorts of all sorts of people. So what I thought was there's no point in me writing a long short story, right? If I'm going to write a novel, what's the point in me taking a short story and making it out to you know, 60, 70,000 words. If I'm going to write a, a novel, it, it's really incumbent on me to try to do something that's nothing like a short story. And so this this isn't nonsense. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed doing it. It's been a lot of fun for me. It's a lot of fun to stay in the same, uh, to stay in the same yes, world, with you know, characters. whereas with this, you happen to abandon people after a month or whatever. So that's been good. Well, we look forward to that one. I leave time for a couple of questions. If you if you have any, I have loads more, but. If you have anything you'd like to ask Wendy, this would be a great chance or a comment right. for her. Well, um, oh, we've got a microphone coming yeah. on there. Yeah. You might not need it, but just in case, so we can all hear you. Well, thank you, Ben. Very interesting. I was going to ask, um, and you kind of added to it here at the end, if you were saying with short stories, you can leave bits for the reader to come in and interpret. Yeah. And I was running in a novel. Does that mean you can't do that? You have to do the extra work for it. But then I thought, if you've got 50 voices in it, I mean, is that not making my very difficult for yourself? It's somebody that says, you know, dialogue and character and and and, and uh, subtext. I mean, 50 voices and people they create. I mean, that seems like a bit cross to carry around. You know? Well, maybe it is, you know. And maybe people will read it, and everybody will think oh, that's just too much. I, I don't know. I think you're right. I think that you, I think that um, getting the reader to do work in a short story. I also like to do work in a novel too. I think I think you're absolutely right that you know, it's, I suppose it's just for an individual. But I like it as well whenever I feel that a, a novelist isn't patronising me, and they're there's they're assuming a sort of an intelligence on my on my behalf. That I can I can work things out. So I, I don't like any novel that I think has got like major designs on me um, in terms of trying to manoeuvre me to feel a certain way, or I don't really like any novel that I think's not trusting me to make connections and do do some work myself. Um, but what I do think is that so let me give you a practical example. So say for example, if I'm writing a short story um, and say it's twenty pages long. I can kind of think that I, if I make reference to something on page 18 that I made reference to on page 6, I can probably reckon that most people will remember that, that because it wasn't that many pages ago. Um, whereas I think with a novel, you know, I can't expect people to remember some wee detail from 200 pages ago, you know? So it's kind, it's, it's kind of like the short story because everything's just tighter. Um, there's there's more that you can rely on in terms of what somebody is going to somebody's going to recall, right? There's totally different problems then for me with the with the novel, I suppose. So say for example, that level of engagement, right? When when you have all these voices, so there's this whole polyphonic thing I really, really like. And one of those things is a book by Will Ashton called Passengers, which is 180 voices. Um, and with that, I 
I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find that really irritating. Like you have to keep recalibrating 180 times, but I didn't find it irritating. But that would be one of the things that things that I'd be, I'd be asking readers of, of, of my, of the, of the novel. Like, how do you find it when suddenly you move from the sort of third person narrative to then this first person? Do you think, oh, that interrupted me? It was in the flow there. It was in the zone, and then suddenly it's some wee random guy that plays football talking about his football team. You know, was that irritating? Um. But you do it also in some of the short stories. You do it the one um, with the woman in the tanning salon and the sort of protection racket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the switch, switch, yeah, switch, the switch, switch there. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. These are yeah, these are kind of shorter than that. They would just be like about sometimes just a couple of paragraphs or whatever. But yeah, is there a working title by the way? Please? Benefactors, the benefactors, the benefactors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question. Thanks very much. Anything? Any others? Before we wrap up, hi. Thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. I have a, a boring prosaic question. How do you work? First of all, how do you manage to carve out time because you have a full time job? And then when you write, do you write in longhand and then type it in to the computer, or do you just sit down at the computer and type away? Right. Uh, the last part of your question, most of the time I write straight into the I write straight into the computer. Um, during the say, during the day, during the working day, I'll probably be thinking about about a story or thinking about something to do with writing, and I might jot down some very 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 brief notes. But I would normally be typing straight into the computer. However, there's a different type of writing that I'll sometimes do. So I'll, I'll review books like for the Guardian, and you know I'll, I'll sometimes do music criticism or whatever and i can't do that straight into the computer it requires me to think in a different sort of way so i'll do that longhand all, always um it, it, it's just a different a different way of working for me um in terms of <coughs> in terms of getting stuff done um i suppose i, I can be really selfish about about what i'm doing here this writing and prioritize that above lots of other things that other people might think are important um, and i can sit in utter disarray and chaos and happily work my house and happily <laughs> and happily work away on on writing um i'm also as well i hope i have the attitude that writing is I don't really like it when people give right. It is a magical, wonderful thing. I adore it, right? But it shouldn't be given special category status, although there, have to, there has to be magical circumstances before you can do it. So this whole thing of, oh, I need to go to a writer's retreat or I need to, you know, sit in a certain room or the muse needs to see me or whatever, I don't really go for any of that. I kind of think, right, okay, you've got a bit of time between, you know, half five and, you know, quarter past six go for it, see what you can get done. So I suppose I, I just try to take opportunities where I can. And I'm not too hard on myself either, I suppose, in terms of um, what, what I don't do is, I don't write and then look at every sentence and go, oh, it's no good, it's no good. Just, just, get it, just get it done and at a later date, have a look, have a look over it. Um, and also what I try to do is I try to leave it at a point where things were going reasonably well, so it's a pleasant <coughs> thing. The prospect of getting back to it is 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 pleasant, but yeah, it's very good advice. Though I think a lot of us <coughs> might try and write something. We're like, oh well, I really want to, but I just can't find. You know, I just don't have the time. I can see so we nodding it back there. You know, it's you've got to prioritize it, make it make it what you do first before other things. Yeah, you've got to write. Yeah, you've got to prioritize it and think it's like absolutely anything. It's it's something that you just need to spend some some time doing regularly. And um, it's like any job that you do, you just you just focus on getting it done, and then you can look at it afterwards and say, did I do a good job or, or, or not? But just being really self conscious about it and going through the whole time thinking, is this good? Is this good? Am I any good? Here, showing it around a few people. Do you like this? Do you like this? We're doing okay. It's only gonna freak you out about it. Just 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 do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the question. There's so much more we could talk about, Wendy. Hope we'll have another chance. But in the meantime, um, well, will you please thank Wendy and welcome back, Patsy. <laughs>
bit in the house work no more. Yeah. You know, <laughs> disagree is okay. But um, uh, yeah, thanks so much and for being so generous with Thank your insights. So and at Camp, we're doing a fantastic job. I want to say that No Alibi Bookstore is here at the back of the room, and there are some of Wendy's books available to buy, and I'm sure she's very happy to sign them yeah. for you. And uh, yeah, and uh, I don't want to let this pass without saying just a big congratulations to No Alibi's um, press as well. It is one of the authors, Bernie McGill, who won the Edgehunt Short Story Prize. So just fantastic for the Short Story Forum and for Northern Ireland writing. And we have uh, one of the best examples of it on the stage. So thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you to Catherine. <laughs>